Welcome back to OMG MotoGP, extra, yeah, extra dose of MotoGP chat for the week. And uh, my name is Harry Benjamin, as always, alongside me is former Grand Prix rider and British champion Keith Hewitt. And Keith, he's only gone and done it. He has only gone and done it, and it's a big deal. It's a massive deal. I, I mean, I was only reflecting on that this morning, you know, thinking to myself, this is like changing families. This is, uh, this is a major issue, not just because of the ramifications from a professional point of view, but from a personal point of view. And I, I feel a bit for him, to be honest, because this will feel like a massive wrench. It's been coming for some time. But this is like, uh, you know, the adopted son that's, that's jumped back into a different family. All right. Fausto Grassini, who's no longer with us, of course, who runs the Grassini team, he's going to be more than happy to, he, he would have been more than happy to welcome him alongside his brother Alex in in, in the Grassini Mona GP team. But again, we've not had actually the press release yet from that team to, to confirm all of this. This is still reasonably speculative in that there isn't anywhere else to go. But of course, you know, maybe he's going to turn around and say, I'm going to retire. You know, you, you never know with these things, do you? <laughs> I, I doubt that completely. Um, but getting out a year early from a contract that he's got with Honda, who have nurtured him, who he has nurtured. And it comes to the loyalty thing, Harry, I think, at the end of the day. Let me think about this for a second. If a rider wasn't performing uh, under his contract with a team, the team would have no compunction in letting him go. And it's the same way the other way around, really. We shouldn't get too over, what's the word, protective of, of Honda in this situation. They have not performed in the manner that we, he, and everyone else might expect them to have improved. And and so, therefore, he's looked to somewhere else. Contract, it's two-way with a contract. There's always a way out if the will is there um, to get out of it. And there's no good enforcing a contract to unhappy parties. You know, if Honda are unhappy with him, They'll let him go. If he's unhappy with Honda, he'll go. And that's what's happened. So, But it is a massive wrench. And these psychological things you've got to get over as well. He's a tough guy. He will. Um, but it's a big deal. Do you think there'll be bad blood between the two? No. Or do you reckon it'll be fairly amicable? I, I don't think there'll be bad blood. This is business at the end of the day. And it's cutthroat top end of the, of the market business, isn't it? It's something that's been in speculate for ages. Everybody must have put a contingency, contingency plan in. Everyone will have thought about the ramifications from the sponsors that are now got all mixed up. Don't forget, there's a the, the, yeah, financial aspect. is not just a, a Honda Marquez thing, Marquez Honda thing. It's about all the periphery that's around that. Their backers, Repsol and so on and so forth, are losing the main Spanish man. I mean, Rep Repsol's on the side of the bike because of Spain, effectively. Don't Repsol, they obviously sponsor Honda, but don't they actually also sponsor individually, Mark, as well? Yeah. So is not is there, does that become a conflict then? Are they going to follow him? Well, I mean, I, I think that these are all things that have had to be worked out. It's the reason why it's taken mm. so long. And it's the reason why we haven't had the, the, the backup press release from Grassini at the moment because it hasn't yet been finished. It's not been finalised. Yeah, you know, HRC, Honda Racing Corporation, were the first people to put out the, the, the press release and Mark put out his own one as well. Um, but there is no follow-up. Normally with these things, you get, you know, within 10 minutes, there's the, the, the second press release that says, yeah, mm -hmm. we accept, you know, we've, you know, we're pl pleased to have the guy on board and so on. But that's not been out yet. And that will be because there are still T's being crossed and I's being dotted somewhere behind the scenes. But it will get done. Um, you know, it's... Uh, this is an exciting time of the year. We've we've got a weekend off this weekend. Um, it's the last chance saloon for everybody to look at their performances, to look at the data in depth, to give it the shakedown. This is really now, we're about to go on to the, the slaughter of the final few Grand Prix of the year in far-flung regions. Um, so now's the time to get down to... And they'll be doing that at Honda. Mark will be doing that, obviously, to try and find where he can get that tiny little extra advantage. Everyone else will be doing the same. It's going to be an incredible end to our season with all this in mind. Yeah, well, just six Grand Prix remaining, plus the sprints as well. So it will be a, a full-out flash. And I suppose it's a bit of a relief maybe as well for Marquez and Honda just to, to have this out there um, after all the room. Of course, as we said, Grassini haven't said he's going there, but that looks like the only logical place. Um, but there's still a lot of questions to be answered. Some we just can't answer because there is still red tape to, to go through, clearly. But it looks like if he does go, he'll be teaming up with Alex, brother and brother in the same team. How do you think that will go down? Perfectly well. I think there will be competition yeah. between them, but I think it will go perfectly well. I, I think that everybody, you know, those two have worked together before. They'll know exactly what they're doing. Um Open arms. I mean, I, I don't see any conflict there at all. Um, both have different styles, 
you know, it will be difficult from a where, where it will be difficult from a team point of view. They have got to manage the the amount of input that the team put into the bikes and so on and so forth. If it starts to go down a development route that that Alex doesn't want or that Mark doesn't want, that's when you get a conflict. Um, a smaller team, a satellite team, can have those kind of problems with with uh, with personnel. But I I doubt. I mean, the, well, well, these are all pros. This is the thing, right? How much? factory support do you think he can expect at Grassini will it will it suddenly be upped a bit more because of Mark Marquez you can be a hundred percent sure that there will be a a tie up really closely with the factory I mean we've heard factory personnel talking about this the possibility of this deal their arms are open they've got Mark Marquez they've got eight bikes on the grid now they've got Mark Marquez probably the best in recent times motorcycle racer that we've seen um, now it remains to be seen whether that, how much of that dip in performance for Honda are down to him and his teammate. You know, now we're going to see next year, the expectation has now got to be realized. Um, that's going to be an interesting time. He's got to get on a different motorbike with, with fairly limited testing, um, completely different characteristics. But everybody that we've seen, including his brother Alex, got on with that bike really well, really quickly. So I would imagine that he will too. Um, it's Could he win the title times. on I mean, a satellite bike? Could he win the title on a satellite bike? We might see the title one on a satellite bike this year in the Pramac uh, department well, because, oh, hey, Martin might well uh, pull that one off. I mean, it's uh, Bagnaia and Martin. It's taking the pressure off of them PR-wise at the moment, isn't it? Because it's uh, <laughs> I mean, they can quietly go about their business while Mark Marquez is stealing all the headlines. Um, but with, what, you know, three points between them at the minute, uh, that little battle is... Um, is warming up quite nicely as we move into, uh, you know, foreign clients. Where are we going? Uh, Indonesia, Phillip Island, Chang International in Thailand, Sepang, Doha, uh, and then back to the freezing cold Valencia on the 26th of November. Good God. <laughs> it could be Bring awful there after that run of really red. Well, I just said, Sammy said that Phillip Island could be bloody freezing. Um, great racetrack, but a funny place to go. Like the, It's like going to a different planet when you go to Phillip Island. <laughs> well i mean I just i i because it is massive news I, i'm trying to i mean you you'll know more than i keith when was the last big move like this has there ever been a bigger move as this well you got rossi haven't you rossi when he went to ducati and that slight arrogance between he and jeremy burgess when they thought they could sort out the ducati in a couple of rounds and be be be, be back to winning uh winning ways that, that didn't work out there have been been things in the past where there's been big stuff eddie lawson when he stuffed agostini because agostini said the marlborough money wasn't there so and then he found out after signing for agostini for for a year that marlborough had actually upped the budget so um, um by the end of the year he jumped ship and went over to, to honda and, and did the winning on that so there have been some fairly massive you know the ones that have been disappointing in my view are people like mick doohan mick doohan did all, everything he did on a honda um you know and probably the greatest honda rider next to mar marquez um there have been people that haven't jumped ship and, and done multi-manufacturer wins. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I like that. I like the fact that he's moved to the, to, to, G, to, G, I can't even say it, <laughs> to Ducati. Um, and we're seeing he's a good team. I mean, like, what they're achieving is, is way above what, what people might have expected. And now with this, you know, situation on board, I mean, Fausto will be cheering from the clouds, I would suggest. Will he be going there as a bit of a sort of a lone ranger? Because the rumours are that he'll be leaving Honda without his crew chief, Santi Hernandez, who sounds like he's going to stay here. That is pure rumour, though, at the moment. But, you know, there's no smoke without fire. And, and we've seen a lot in MotoGP that riders move and, and crew chiefs and other team members tend to follow. Yeah, and sometimes change is as good as a rest. We've seen that as well before, where people have taken on different crew chiefs to shake it up a little bit. Um Santi Hernandez is like a brother, you know. Like you, they're joined at the hip, Mark and Santi. I mean, even in airports, they sit next to each other. You know, it's it's a, it's a relationship, a real relationship, um, and that will be hard to. Mark has got a lot to get over. This is not just as simple as signing a piece of paper, jumping on another motorbike, and and starting a relationship elsewhere. Now that might spark him into great things, and I think it probably will because he's got that mentality. You know, he's a He's 30 years old now. He's got all the tools. There ain't one in. There's nothing that's missing out of his locker of, of, of tools and, and how to deal with each and every incident. But that change of personnel can trip you up a bit. 
you know, the communication. Um, you know, Spanish, Italian, da, 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 da. He's got all that to work his way through. But he's been around the paddock a long time. Everybody knows everybody. You know, everybody knows everybody really well. So it's it's not going to be something that's going to be, you know, alien. It's not like dropping him in a different country and you're changing nationality. It's a, it's a, it's a situation where, you know, he knows the people he's dealing with. He will have had meetings with them. He probably knows them as well as half the guys he deals with at Honda in the background that, that he, you know, as he's by his own voice has said that he didn't even know the name of a guy that uh, he was dealing with the other week, um, which, as I said previously, that seems slightly odd to me and, and quite indicative of the fact that he was likely to be on his bike and he quite literally is. He's off on bike and on another. Yeah. Um, on the flip side, at Honda HQ... In terms of a replacement, and we briefly spoke about it with Pete on Monday, are they in panic mode no, now? Because no, what no, no. They I, th- I, I think completely the opposite. I think what this has done okay. is given them a breather. They can now develop something um, without the input of Mark. Mark Marcus is Mark Marcus is such a strong personality. He's such a strong rider. What he wants, he wants, he gets generally, and it may not be the way that Honda have wanted to go. That bike has been built basically for Mark Marquez and that has almost been their downfall in the, and no one else can ride the bloody thing. Um, so we've, we've got, a, it's a double-edged sword when you've got someone like Mark Marquez on it. Um, so now that he's away, you know, they can start moving in a direction they want to move in in a milder manner. I mean, there's a lot of things going on at the moment. I mean, there's, there's been discussions recently about the 2027 rule changes that are coming up. 2027 is a crux year for MotoGP. You've heard me say before, I don't believe the manufacturers should have quite the the rights that they have to, to, to manipulate the rules in the way they have. Like They have to be a unanimous agreement um, to, to rule change, and I think that's counterproductive. I think that Dorna should flex their muscles here and take control of this because we are going to end up in a situation where bikes are too fast for some of the tracks we're going to. The developments are going in the wrong direction in that you know, it, it can't be sustainable. Um, so therefore, Dorna need to be able to batter the, the manufacturers to some extent and push them into a situation where Dorna see the championship going. I'll be really interested to hear what people have to say on, on our website here. Um, you know, please do write in. Um, but it is a situation where I think the, the, the almost monopoly regarding the rules because of the, 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 the unanimous um, side of that's concerned from the manufacturers is counterproductive. It needs to change. I think that Dorna need to get a grip on this. Problem you've got, motorbikes are too fast. MotoGP bikes are getting too fast. <clears throat> Everybody talks about, well, it doesn't, it's not really all about top speed. It's not really all about, we just want to see good close racing. <clears throat> Excuse me. We want to see good close racing, um, which is right. But as you bring the MotoGP bikes back from the brink of a prototype's potential, you then bring world superbikes up you can't have a domestic you can't have a, a bloody production based series that's almost as fast or faster in some respects than a motor gp prototype class so therefore dawner own both series they have got to manipulate world superbikes as well and drag them back from the brink before long we'll have road bikes that are bloody faster than, than proper race bikes <laughs> which will be a real bad thing to be um, but the point is, is that this all needs incrementally moving around. The, the, the whole goal, the goalpost situation needs to to move. And Runner GP cannot get much faster and stay on all of the tracks that we like them on because it's getting quick. Um, we've got tyre changes coming up soon, construction changes that are coming up in a year or two's time as well. But I think 2027, where the major rule changes are coming, where the engineering is all working towards that set of rule changes, I believe... Dorna, and and again, we're in. You know, we've lost Mike Trimby recently, the head of Urta. You know, massive loss in that paddock. Same is going to happen with Carlo Espeleta. Uh, hopefully, not. You know, demise wise, but he has to surely, at his age, stop being the head of things. And Carlos Espeleta, his son, that's coming up through the ranks, who who originally was actually by Carmelo Espeleta, Carlos Espeleta was dumped into the. The, the depths of Erta, the International Race Teams Association, worked under Mike Trimby and the rest of them and was, and was like the lad that got the clatter on the back of the head and, and he's come up the heart. He's come up the long way. It'd be like doing an apprenticeship with a with a firm. Carlos Espeleta is, is no fool, but he's going to be in charge. At, you know, he, He's going to be the head man at some stage in the not-too-distant future. I like the guy. He's dynamic. He's fast. He's a quick thinker. Um, and he needs to, they need to take control of their 
succession as much as Erta has had to take control of theirs now that Mike's no longer in the at the helm. Mm. A lot of things changing in the next few years, and it needs to be handled in a in a in a good way. It, it ne- never it's stops giving, does it, MotoGP? Every year we just wonder anything. we wonder what can happen next year. We always say, "Can next year be as good?" Yeah, it can with that kind of management, with the right management. But twenty twenty seven is a is a crux year. If you want a, a bit more on all things technical, we spoke to the man in charge of it all, Danny Aldridge, just a few uh, a few shows ago. So you can head back to the archives and have a have a deep dive into, into what he uh, what his daily day to day job and, and the plans for um, Motor GP going forward. Um, getting towards the end of this little extra uh, show and outside of the Marquez rumours um, and com- confirmation now. Uh, I saw that it's likely Pedro Acosta, another wonder kid, um, is going to get his MotoGP ride next year and looks like he's going to replace the rookie Augusto Fernandez uh, down at uh, KTM. Uh, and so that will be uh, alongside Paulo Spargro. So then the, the factory lineup will remain the same with Binder and Miller. Do you reckon Acosta might have been a little target for Honda though at one point or could well still be? I don't think that the, everything is always on the table. At the end of the day, everything is always there. Who would you put? Who's your Mark Marquez replacement? Well, who would you put? Yeah, you, you're in charge. Okay, who are you in your your, your two HRC seats and your two LCRs? I'd be looking because first obviously and they foremost. Signed Zarko, I'd be looking first and foremost. I'd, I'd be looking first and foremost at where the development is with regard to the bike. We can't know that what's going on back at the factory. What do they want? Mm-hmm. They've re-signed Takanakagami. Would I have done that? I wouldn't have. I'd have been looking for for. Yeah, you know, okay, he's a stable default mode. You know, he he speaks the same language as as obviously the main factory, and that is important, is to that feedback in the same language with the same nuance is really, really important when you're developing stuff. Um, so maybe that was a given he should have stayed where he did in on a Honda. But after that, you know, you need a bit of young blood in there. They they've not got anybody that's that's who's the development bikes? I'd have been looking at bloody getting Cal Crutzo back, but Yamaha have kept him on, you know. Yeah, there, there are, it's a very difficult call for Honda, and it depends on the direction development-wise where they're going. You know, one-year contract with somebody just to tie them over for the time being. The shock of losing Marquez in 2024. Let's tide it over with, you know, whoever they decide. But I, I, what about I, a, would, would a, a Costa, chantra? My question would be, would a Costa risk going to Honda when they're in a transition stage? Mm. Big risk for a, for an up and coming superstar like Acosta, and seeing the way that KTM have gone, you know we've just seen this carbon fiber frame that's been working really well straight out of the box. When you see developments like that, you think to yourself, "Hang on a second, that's in its infancy. We're still going forward here. They're still making steps at KTM. Would you step off that roundabout? If I was him, no, I wouldn't. And if I was his management, I would stop him from doing it as well. I mean, this whole thing at the moment, management management must be tearing their area. They're certainly working for their money at the moment with all the things that are going on behind the trucks. Um, talking of, of, of future as well, we got Evan Belford, the, the the kid that's just won the um, the British Town Cup, that's uh, just announced that he signed up for Red Bull Rookies next year as well. So he's on the ladder to to Moto Three and 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 the like. In in well, he's he's racing in Aragon in the Junior World Championship race meeting this weekend, I think. Uh, the penultimate round of the uh, junior GP. So um, Evan Belford's on his way. Um, I'm going to miss him over here, but uh, great stuff. Great to see a British guy that's that's uh, on his way. So worth a shout there too. Yeah, absolutely. One final thing. I, if I was Honda, it's, you know, you've got you've got two teams. You can kind of move move the seats around. And you know, Zarco's going to go to LCO. He's signed by HRC, but he, he could well be moved about. Um, they have Ike Lacona clearly on their books as well. And as much as I'm a fan of him, surely for for a Honda uh, PR move as well, take a chance now on somebody like a, a Chantra or an Ayagura, stick them in an LCR, well, give it a shot. Yeah, they're all already on the Indomitsu Asia, you know, Asia Honda Cup, uh, Asia Honda team, Hiro Ayama. The, the, so they have a, a direct connection, and 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 I'm sure that is on the cards. I'm sure they will be looking at that as well, but. You know, moving across a, a, a Moto Two rider into a, into a, a Moto GP team, you've got to manage the rider and the bike at the same time, and they're looking at development. I would suggest more than uh, performance at the moment. Um, mm. You know, we're, we're forgetting about the other guy that's actually riding for him at the minute. He's quite good as well. He used to be a world champion. 
Um, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, don't, don't write him off yet. I mean, the, the fact is, is that once they got rid of Mark, maybe maybe some of the development stuff will go towards him and he'll, he'll start, you know, they'll start picking their performances up. But he's not been, he's been right there, there or thereabouts. He he might not be of having been quite as prepared to risk it all like Mark would. Mark would crash three mm. times in a weekend just as a case of finding where the limit is, whereas Joanne has, 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 has basically, you know, ridden well. But hasn't been thrown at the thrown at the scenery quite as much. Um, so don't don't write him off yet. He's he's quite a handy rider. <laughs> no, that's true. Well, they've got Joe Amir, they've got Zarko coming, and they've got Takanakagami at the moment, haven't they? So uh, well, you've got, got, you got they've got three, three out of four, three good stable riders there. You know, Zarko yeah. is he finished? Is he not finished? I mean, who the hell can tell? I mean, he's a he's a he's a you could hold a conference about giant Zarko's <laughs> mentality, couldn't you? He's a He's a very unusual man and goes about it in a in a very different way to a lot of people. But you know he can be fast. Let's see where it all heads. It's I would think that that Honda have got to concentrate on where the direction they want to go with these bikes. Again, at the end of the day, there's too little testing. Um, maybe maybe that's going to be something that's going to be coming up more and more during the course of next year as we head towards 2027 rule changes and so on. That that, that you know concessions and the like are are made more available more testing maybe is made more available but then with a lengthened you know series 22 rounds next year that's going to put even more pressure on teams financially and physically you know i was with a load of guys yesterday um that are just you know they're absolutely knackered already i mean you only you know these are young guys that are used to this job and they're and 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 that you know indonesia that's coming up you know a lot of them are going out on sunday and and that's it for the next few weeks where they're they're swapping continents and across to to and a lot of these places are debilitating in the the temperatures and the way that you live is completely different to how it is in Europe. So and is there enough men on on site all of the time to manage all of these events that we've got? You only need one or two of them to get sick in the middle of it all, and then suddenly you're at short staffed, and that can be that can be difficult in the office, let alone at the, the racetrack. So mm. it, it's. There's a lot to shake out yet this year. You know, it's first year of sprinting and so on and so forth. I mean, I, it's been a fantastic year so far. And there's a world championship that's got three points in it. You know, hang on. <laughs> yeah. Easy to forget that amongst everything else, isn't it? <laughs> there's a lot you could, I tell you what, in any of these conversations, we can bubble off down a, a rabbit hole looking at whatever we want to look at. And it's greatly interesting. And then beside that is a whole field full of rabbit holes that we haven't even touched on. You know, there's so much stuff that you can... You can get into depth on, um, but you'd have to be listening to a podcast all day long, and we'd have to be rabbiting on all day long. And I don't think anybody's got patience. Oh, by the way, thank no. you to the guy that said, "Put your bloody pictures on the wall." Somebody said, "I've got to put my pictures on the wall." But look at this. I dug it out from over there a minute ago. An aluminium belly pan. Look at that. That was a very rare item on a on a TZ750, and um, that only lasted about two meetings because I squashed it flat, and you can't replace them because they're not out. 1979, oh when I was a whippersnapper, my first British Championship. Do you have um? Do you have any of your old bikes? Like, do you own them or anything? No. Um, no. Uh, I was the uh, perennial uh, privateer early on, and anything you owned, you sold for the next year. Yeah. Um, and that's you know anybody in racing that doesn't have family money um, will be aware of that, and we'll be quite sad about it. I mean, there are some bikes. Having said that, that motorcycle is still running. 29th of October, there's a there's an event going on at the National Motorcycle Museum up near um, Birmingham Airport, the NEC and the like. The National uh, Motorcycle Museum is on the on the, the land plot up there, and there's a, a TZ750, an hour and a half um, slot of it. I mean, I think Steve Plater is uh, hosting it, and Arnold Fletcher to get back to that bike. Arnold Fletcher, who still has that motorcycle in his garage, my 1979 uh, championship winning. Uh, Northwest 200 lap record holding TZ will be among them, and so will some of Dave Potter's oh. old bikes and the like as well. Be a proper old blokes will be sat on a wall with our sticks out the front. You youngsters Zimmer can come up and toe. see us. <laughs> Get your Zimmer frame as well, and you'll be hey, fine. Uh, let's live. <laughs> we'll, we'll call it there, shall we? Um, fantastic. And actually, somebody who also has sold off a bike, uh, a world championship winning bike, is Carl Fogarty. And this weekend, uh, we have got coming to our YouTube channel, Down the Pub, with Carl Fogarty. Keith, we've already pubbed it a few times, but it is now coming this weekend. Keith had a nice chinwag. We split it into two parts with Carl. Um, 
and I've I've already had a watch and listened to it. There's some proper interesting stuff out there that you don't necessarily know about, Carl. So uh, I think it's well worth a watch, uh, even if I say so, and I'm sure you say so as well, Keith. <laughs> love love working with Carl. I mean, he's he's good fun. He it's amazing that he is still an anxious, nervous being in a public environment, bearing in mind that's the strength of the man. And I think that comes across in 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 this. It's, it's a, down the pub. We're sat on a chair. We've got a room full of people. It's very intimate, very very small venue. Actually, the venue. Uh, the stirrup cup at uh, Barton Seagrave is owned by um, Chris Herring, who was originally Patronus PR, um, on the Britain PR, yeah, part of Carl's Ducati, uh, and he manages Leon Haslam still, believe it or not. So Chris Herring's pub, we were down at, if you want to know the link, that's why we're all there. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we'll put the uh, the address and where you can go to the pub as well in in the bio for the uh, for the down the pub episodes. But stay tuned for that. Um, but in the meantime, I think that's your extra dose for this week. No racing this weekend, but we'll keep you busy. Don't you worry. And then we're into Indonesia chat next week. Um, but in the meantime, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And from myself, Harry Benjamin, and from Keith Hewen, we'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>